decided to switch it up today. Got a little bit of elevator music. Hey, how's everybody doing? Welcome to Monday. <laughs> are you go are you going up? What floor? <laughs> oh man. Well, good day to everyone who is joining us today for our live stream. Let me go ahead and get the rest of this stuff set up while while we cook in the background. Not really. But um yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would be both. I had to take a protein shake. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you know what? I kind of was digging that music. Turn that back on while we just lower it. Yeah. It's welcome to the elevator where education is going up, up, and away. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, good day. Good day. It is... Monday. It's weird, man. Like the the weekends just kind of disappear right out from underneath me. Like it starts and then somebody messages me on Sunday and they're like, so are you guys going to talk about this tomorrow? And then I'm like, oh, I totally forget that Monday comes right after Sunday. <laughs> like I just, <laughs> I had it. I had it until they said that. Uh, well, I'll start off today with a thank you to our top sponsor, FPEA for being with us through this journey. We appreciate their support. We have recently established our 501c3, so it'll make it even easier to fill out the rest of those spots for our top sponsors. But we thank them for being with us in this journey. We look forward to the FBEA convention that's coming up. Uh, what's the exact date on that? I just drew a blank as I started talking about it. Well, there you go. It's always Memorial Day weekend. Um, we will be there. We've had other people ask us, and we will be there. We're looking forward to seeing everyone else. Um, it'll be great. We'll have some celebrative, celebratory moments. Um, there are lots of fun things going on there. Um, all, without further ado, though, here we are. Our live faces. Brenda, good day. How are you? Good. Good. I was going to say, uh, you're. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because you we get so down into the weeds on it and then we step away, you know, you know, because we, we actually are humans and have personal lives and things going on. But it's like you look away for a second and you look back and it's like, wait a minute. Now I've got to figure I got to get dive back into all this. Hold on a second. <laughs> What's going on? Um, it's what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I felt that. I felt that immensely. We had, uh, we were actually, we were just talking with that yesterday with a couple of people who uh, were like, well, how's everything going now, and et cetera. And we were checking in with them and they were, they were upset because we weren't able to go on the, they went on a hiking trip which I was really looking forward to taking the kids hiking. Um, and we just couldn't go. And they're like, yeah, well, you blew us off and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hang on a second. Like, I, I have something I have to do here. Like, it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't mad. They weren't really mad. No, not really. They were just razzing me. Yeah, they were just razzing me, which is fine. Uh, but I love them. And that is cool. And just thank you for everything you do. Give me funds for you to transfer you can save stuff. Okay, we'll get into some of those questions. Um, but as we get started today, I, I one of the questions I've been getting a lot lately because legislative session ended on March 8th is, okay, so now the legislative session's over, what are you doing? Or... Uh, what's going on? And getting ready for the next session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting ready for the next session. But that's a year. That's like nine months away. What What are we doing in the meantime? What So what are some of the things right now that are being watched? Uh, well, the governor still can veto bills. 
Mm -hmm. um, it takes the legislature after everything is finished with the legislative process, the getting the bills in the right format, making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, et cetera, et cetera, from bill drafting and, you know, that particular part. Then they send them over to the governor's office. And after session, once he receives a bill, he has 14 days to uh, decide what he's going to do with it. Normally, those things are negotiated prior to the end of session. Mm -hmm. So chances are that whatever's being sent over there will be signed into law mm -hmm. um but occasionally he vetoes something you know there could be a big push by the communities that are affected by the legislation and if he doesn't have a vested interest in it then he'll veto a bill so i've had a couple of bills that i had language in vetoed not my issue but because there were other issues in the bill mm -hmm. he didn't the a previous governor didn't like right they would veto him so it's not over till it's over That's and true. it becomes law so um we won't know until first it hits his office then 14 days later whether something has officially been signed into law mm -hmm. so then which most people don't know about if they're if those bills are not clearly written and there's any um, parts that need clarification, the department which would oversee that particular area of law will be required to write rules. And then the rulemaking process typically is a couple of months, and you will have okay. to track those on um, the um, website that uh, has the rules uh, on it, which is the Florida Administrative Code. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to track what they're doing, work with the department. If they're interpreting things differently than we think that the legislature intended, then they pass their rules. Now, they've been really pretty fast in terms of rule writing uh, related to the scholarship programs because they generally get administered um, uh, July 1st as the implementation date. So the department tries to move that process along pretty quickly. But I know in the past there were uh, rules written for the implementation of IDEA, which is federal legislation for students with disabilities. It took two years to get rules written. Mm -hmm. So there's always wow. stuff going in the background that we need to keep track of, make sure we're protecting the rights of families mm -hmm. that we represent. I mean, I don't represent the private schools in terms of uh, those in scholarship. We certainly have an opinion and sometimes we voice those opinions, but sure. uh, those aren't really the families we represent. We represent those that are directing the education of their own children. So we'll have to watch those um, during the next few months. And then elections, we're trying to identify mm -hmm. those fam those um people that are running for the legislature, both House and Senate, that are friendly to school choice, especially friendly to home education. And then we need to see if we can find a bill sponsor because right after the election, they come up here the next week, get sworn in, and we're off to the races again. So there's not a whole lot of breathing room between session and session. Yeah, it seems like there is <clears throat> because it's like, oh, OK, cool. This is March and next session will be, you know, next year. Right. But it's it, March it, and it, April of next yeah, year. Yeah. But is, there's not a lot of breathing room, uh, like you say. So it's really it is really important. There's also there are there are things that are not necessarily related to lobbying that I think that historically you've you've done because you're in the the go-to person seat. You're, you're in the know. You have worked to build the connections. You're the person people call. And now that, that team of people is growing. And, you know, Crystal and I'm I so are... I'm so thankful. 
<laughs> we're happy to be I am here. so thankful. We're happy to be here. Um, and and we're fielding a lot of those calls now as well. But I still th I think that a lot of people maybe think that, okay, well, your work is done because you've lobbied and, it, and it's over. So now what? And Crystal, you had, you've been getting all kinds of calls. Um, you had recently had one that you were working on. Do you want to take a minute and kind of tell a little bit about that? I know you have to kind of maybe. Before you move into that, mm -hmm. let me just say, okay. this is the education of parents phase and resolving mm -hmm. the problems that they run into with the various entities like uh, state colleges with the Certainly. school districts. This is, this is where we then do some local lobbying, even though, mm -hmm. you know, it, it still is lobbying when we're calling the school districts and trying to educate them, or we're calling the state universities and trying to make sure that they understand dual enrollment. So, so this is the phase of the work that you and Crystal have gotten involved with, especially Crystal, mm -hmm. when we get complaints from parents and then we take on the right. advocacy position for those people because we know people in Tallahassee and people that know people out in the field. So right. I'm sorry that, to interrupt that, but no, it's, no, no, it's great. part of the advocacy work. Yeah, I was going to say and that that's ultimately why we also went ahead and made the 501c3 because there's actually a ton of work that we end up doing uh, in, in the advocacy sphere and community building uh, sphere because it's not directly lobbying and influencing legislation, but because we're those people, we get a lot of those calls. And so it just kind of makes sense to 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 help. I, I hate telling somebody, no, that's not my job. I know I know all that <laughs> stuff, but no, that's not my job. I like our, our garbage man. <laughs> oh, this irritates me so bad. Our garbage <laughs> man pulled up the other day. And uh, the I guess the garbage can was like <laughs> turned slightly or something. And, you know, like he just dro like drove by and didn't pick up the garbage because, you know, getting out and turning the garbage can is not his job. <laughs> He's just going to operate the arm and lift it up into the back. And I was like, wow, talk about sticking to your job description to the letter. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I hate being in the position to be able to help someone with the knowledge and stuff that we built and then just saying no. So we've continued to grow and and focus efforts on advocacy and on community building, even though it's not directly lobbying, which is what the 501c3 is for. And Crystal, you had a really interesting experience recently. Um, go. I don't want to steal your thunder. So you go ahead and, okay. and tell kind of how it came about and what happened. Okay, um, before I do that, I just wanted to add to that that the other part of um, community building and education that we do, of course, the forum and what we're doing here with the live streams, but also um, going to local you know, conferences and conventions and local events, which we've oh, yeah. got several lined up over the next few months um, for people who have requested us to just come and explain legislation to their group or something like that. So that's the other piece of what we do. Um, but yeah, so what I did uh, this past week, I think it was, um, there's a private college that was approved as a provider with Step Up. They had been approved since, I think, August, some very early. Um, and I had talked with them before. They were having issues actually getting paid. So they had students who had uh, used the direct pay through Step Up system mm -hmm. to pay for post-secondary classes, like dual enrollment type classes at their private college, but Step Up had never actually paid the provider. So the problem that they were running into now was they're coming up on graduation and the students were not going to be able to graduate because their accounts weren't paid. And so this was obviously a big uh, issue. <laughs> and so what I was able to do was reach out to our contacts at Step Up because these uh, the provider had already contacted Step Up and done everything they could. They'd submitted, uh, you know, support tickets and called customer service over and over, and they just kept getting told, everything looks fine on our end. You just need to wait. And then, you know, it's been months. So um, that's another piece that we do. We do have contacts at places like Step Up. So I was able to send a message to one of our contacts there 
and just ask them to look into what was going on. And I got a response back saying that they were going to look into it. And then I never heard back. So I was hoping that, you know, they were gathering information. And then the next thing I knew, I was hearing back from the, the school saying, thank you so much for whatever you did. Everyone's been paid. So I don't know what our contact at Step Up did, but I sent him a thank you email because <laughs> obviously he did something to trigger the payout that had just been sort of stuck in a glitch for months. So that's another piece that because, uh, you know, we have relationships and we've built those relationships, we can advocate for those individual situations mm -hmm. whenever the person has, a, a, I do have to give the caveat that we're not step up customer service. So yes. we're always going to say, please contact customer support. But if you've yeah. already done that and you've done everything you're supposed to do and you're just still not getting any kind of help then we may be able to reach out and ask somebody in one of the higher up departments to, to look into it. But they, the first thing they're going to ask is, have they contacted customer support? So, right. you know, if you've already done that, then we can advocate for you in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when it comes down to everything is running as it, as it should, but somehow these 24 kids aren't going to graduate. Right. Yeah. And that, that to us is really, Things like that are very, very important um, and kind of need swift attention. So now it's really cool that that worked out. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes we get calls and we pass information up and the lab. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Deline Howell. Poor Deline. We advocated <laughs> for months. Months uh, and months. We we kept getting told, oh, we're looking into it. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, I mean, we're, we're advocates. We don't mm -hmm. have access to step up system directly and we can't make the changes for you, but we can advocate for you at least. Well, going back to the dual enrollment issue, if we can veer off just a little bit. Um, sure. The scholarship allows parents to pay post-secondary institutions for their classes. Mm -hmm. Well, in the budget this year, somebody who's a homeschool advocate, we were not advocating for this, but uh, they saw that in order for parents to be able to uh, utilize their scholarship and to do dual enrollment, they had the right to do dual enrollment. But uh, even though when this bill PEP passed, it said that they have all the rights that home educated students have. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like we've mentioned before, the legislation didn't spell out some of the details. So all the it, it all goes back to funding and mm -hmm. the money. And so in the budget this year, in order to help clarify, they put a line item which would allow private post-secondary institutions that are approved by the Commission on Independent Education to um, to uh, apply for the dual enrollment scholarship on behalf of their home education or PEP students. Home education students and private school students already had that right, but the private post-secondary institutions were not approved actually for home education students. So they put money in the budget to allow if you wanted to go to, uh, say, Stetson. I mean, it's a big university if they do dual enrollment or career and technical education. They were not approved in the dual enrollment scholarship. Hmm. They were only for state universities and, and colleges. Um, but now, the, because the money's in the budget, the um, private institutions post-secondary institutions will be able to count those students and then turn in the number of students and the number of classes that they're taking so that they can get paid out of the dual enrollment scholarship, which is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, huge. We, we did have a question that came in along that lines, <clears throat> and it, it says, uh, thank you for everything that you, that you do. Uh, can PEP funds be transferred to a 529 college savings plan? 
No, unless something's changed. Um, we actually had a whole post in our forum early on about that, but I don't think this mm -hmm. was changed in the, in the bill this year. So it should still be the same. Um, yeah, for UA, way. they can roll over to a 529, but for mm -hmm. PEP, they can't. However, you can still continue to use your funds after graduation for up to, it's up to two years of inactivity on the account. Correct. Um, if you have leftover funds in your account. Um, but if you yeah. go inactive for two years, then they kind of expire. But yeah, up until that point, you can use them for qualified expenses. So whatever's in the purchasing guide, you can continue, which does include some post-secondary expenses and things like that. So mm -hmm. you can't roll it into a 529, but you can continue to use it after graduation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the way that that was explained to me was that the inactivity of two years, you know, as long as there's activity in the account, you know, for the, the that two, year, two years of inactivity just kind of pushes the end date for the account out. You won't continue so, to receive funds, but you can use no. whatever you have left over. In the Correct. Project. Yeah. So it will remain until two years of inactivity, which is not the way that it was explained to me at first, but recently got clarification on that. That's very interesting. So uh, then we have but another. That can, that can apply if I'm if I'm incorrect, then clarify. But if a parent to. has a scholarship, but they don't use it for two years, they lose it. Right. So the inactivity don't. would apply there as well. Correct. Yes. yes. Also correct. Yeah. So they're just sitting on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michelle Wilson says, have you reached out for clarification on the time restrictions in the latest purchasing guide? Uh, question mark. Oh, I'll take for, that one. <laughs> okay. For example, Good. elective supplies once a year. Um, so can you only buy garden soil once a year, et cetera? Okay, so the first thing to clarify is that these are not new restrictions. I mm -hmm. went back and combed through every frequency of purchase uh, today before this live stream and compared mm -hmm. the new guide to the previous guides, and that has not changed. So those frequency of purchases were actually there from the start. Yes. The only thing they've changed is they went through and removed the spending cap amounts. So there used to be frequency of purchase limits and spending caps. And Do you want me to pull any of those up on screen? Frequency of purchase. Um, I mean, if someone talking? has if someone has a specific question, you can. Otherwise, okay. um, I don't have any further clarity on these frequency of purchases because, like I said, they're not new. So she says unless... they're new for UA. So I haven't. Okay. The... Well, I haven't combed. What I was combing through was the PEP guide. If they're new for UA, maybe they decided to make it uniform for what was in PEP. They're not new for PEP. Um, I'll have to pull up the previous UA guide and the new one, and I haven't had a chance to compare those yet. Um, because most of the questions I was getting were regarding the PEP one and people worrying about these limitations, which, like I said, I just wanted to point out are actually not new. They've been there since mm -hmm. the start for PEP. Um, now, whether they're enforcing them strictly or not, that I'm not sure because like if you look at the elective supplies, art supplies is on that list and then it says there's a frequency of purchase for supplies for um, you know once per year. I don't know how strictly they're enforcing that. Um, obviously, right. the, the concern that was expressed was, you know, what if I have an artist? I'm going to need to buy paints more than once per year. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. I know that this year for my kids, I bought paint more than once, but I didn't buy maybe the exact same paint. <laughs> so I don't know if they're looking at exact same the item, exact same item, or if they're yeah. looking at type. Um, that is something I don't have clarity on. But what I can say is that it's not a new restriction. So whatever they were doing to enforce it before is probably going to be similar to what they're doing moving forward. Um, we can look for clarity on that. I can reach out and see what else I can find out. Yeah. The, I'm looking, I don't have, I didn't download the UA one. I can I'm pull looking that. for it now. I have the old UA one and it, it has some frequency purchase limitations in it, but it's not nearly the ones that uh, PEP does. Um, <clears throat> Is it, was it only certain categories that the old one had? Um, here, let me see. On? Okay, 
right here. This is... We will answer your question in real time. Just give us a second. <laughs> All right, I've got the new one. Possible. <laughs> yes, I've got the new one pulled up. Um, okay. Let me pull up the old one to compare. So the FESUA1 implements page four policies, uh, prohibited items, gaming systems, smartwatches, frequency of purchase, two years for per digital and periphery devices. Um, Television, let me see, books are neither capped nor subject to frequency of purchase, two copies, limitations. So you're looking key. you're looking at the old one right now? Yeah. Yeah, 9 23 okay. uh, And the frequency of purchase televisions may be purchased every once every two years. Those are the only ones that I see in the old one. So there weren't frequency of purchases on any of the other categories? Um, I don't see, I did a live search for the language frequency, but... Um, yeah, no, I don't see them as I'm looking down through. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you see do you see them added on your end? I'm looking now. Okay. I'm gonna go back to comments and make sure if anyone's adding comments that I follow them. Let me see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Elective supply purchase frequency for PEP are new. That's what's been said. All right, let me get to the elective section. But weren't you looking for UA? Mm -hmm. She was. Oh, I'm reading the comments. Sorry. I'm reading down through the comments. The thing yeah, to keep I'm in mind. I'm looking in the new UA guide to see. The thing to keep in mind here also is that the purchasing guide is no longer a updated once a year unanimous consent document it's now what we call a live document which means that it can be updated at any time um, and the new the new updates can be added it's more agile and more mobile so my biggest encouragement here is <clears throat> to submit feedback there is a place on uh, step up for students website for uh, feedback for the purchasing guide it's right next to where you download the purchasing guide. So it's pretty easy to find. And I highly, it was never once a year. Was there a frequency hmm. of purchase for PE equipment in the old one? In the old UA? Yeah. Um, looking. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I do see frequency of purchase for elective supplies and equipment. It's mm -hmm. the same frequency of purchase that's on PEP. One one year for supplies, mm -hmm. two years for equipment. Um, yeah, that might be new if it's not in the previous. Call. It might be, and you know, I'm I'm not a hundred percent certain on. How... It's not new for PEP. It's been there all year. Yeah, I'm not sure how um, solid they're going to be on some of these. I highly recommend using the feedback forms to put your feedback in because they're required by law to take feedback from parents um, into the guide. But the new statutes for UA also require them to work with the, um, the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities in crafting the purchasing guide. And so they work with Step Up and AAA will be working with the Florida Center the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities. We need a name for that. <laughs> that center. is the name. I know. And we need a shorter name. And as Jason uh, mentioned, they are also now required to regularly update the purchasing guidelines. Right. So yeah. if they make any changes, I think they have, what, 30 days mm -hmm. uh, to put those changes on the website. So yes. this, like Jason said, this is now going to be an evolving document mm -hmm. um, rather than one that stays static for the entire so yeah, and one um, of the things I, that i've go ahead i was just going to say from my understanding and experience of this there may be some mid-year monthly updates but if they were going to do that my thoughts are that they probably are going to add uh, prohibited expenditures based on the legislation because mm -hmm. uh, 
the DOE is fully aware and the commissioner has to approve any changes um, that what the legislature was concerned about when they put the language in there for equipment for as instructional material were the out of norm expenses that people were saying they use their scholarship for. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I don't think they're going to go in and do a whole lot of tweaking unless a problem arises is my thought about this, because think how confusing it would be right. if somebody purchased something in January and then in February they came out and said, well, you can't purchase that. It's on the prohibited list or you mm. can only spend up to a certain amount on that item. Well, then does that mean that it, is retroactive or does mm -hmm. that mean it is current and imagine the processors trying to keep up with the right. purchasing dates and when the new things went in so i think they right. gave them that flexibility if somebody's saying i bought a eight was it an 85 inch tv right yeah something like um that. and they may go in and say they may deny it but then they may go in there and put that item in the purchasing guide so that everybody that looks for a TV will find out they can't purchase an 85 inch TV, or it has to have one of those educational benefit forms filled out. And the parent has to justify why they couldn't do with a smaller TV. Yeah, I agree that I think the statutes were intended to give them the ability to edit it as needed not that they're planning to just be constantly changing. Um, mm -hmm. And I would also be surprised if the spending caps come back because they made such a big deal about removing them mm -hmm. as of December and sent out the email saying they were being removed. <clears throat> so that's something that I'm hoping yeah. doesn't come back, but I yeah. have no reason to suspect that it will. I think it's really <laughs> important. I think it's very easy to get upset by the change. Uh, the, none of us really like change. So when we see any of it, like, <laughs> All the, the, oh my goodness, PEP had the restrictions and now like they're adding them to UA. They're going to ruin everything. I, I can just hear, you know, I can hear the, the bells. The important thing to keep in mind is that if they added the restrictions in statute and then they go, oh, that wasn't enough and they add more and they go, oh, that wasn't enough and they add more until that 70 page document that's a purchasing guide gets added to statute that thing never would change right it would never have the flexibility of adapting to parent feedback that this document has the potential to have and this document is not even the one that AAA is going to operate by so triple a can make their own document and they're no longer required by statute to have unanimous consent among the documents which gives them it gives you, us, as parents, a little bit of an advantage because, oh, well, this per this SFO interpreted it this way. This FF SFO gives us that. Now we have options, and they have a reason to give us options that are different. And there, there are mechanisms in place, and there's requirements for them to take parent feedback, and then there are mechanisms. I will say this. They haven't really... Uh, I, I can't speak for AAA because I haven't talked to anyone from AAA recently, but Step Up for Students hasn't really hammered down what their parent feedback process looks like. Um, what you're seeing right now is they don't want to be paying those fines. The fines that are in statute that require them to get the guide out, published, and up by a certain date and modified are what they're trying to avoid. And so what you're seeing right now is that's happening. Well, they um, do trying... have a feedback form on the purchasing yeah. guide, and they had that early mm -hmm. on as well. Mm -hmm. So that they have one for UA and they have one for PEP. So mm -hmm. what they do with that feedback after they receive it, that part we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that they, they gather feedback at the open houses. There's like a little mm -hmm. exit survey that they ask parents to fill out. They gather yeah. feedback through these um, purchasing guide feedback forms. And from our experience this year, the decision makers at Step Up really actually are listening to that feedback. They mm -hmm. are constantly evolving. Um, we've encountered multiple times um, in discussions with them where they've told us, well, we made this change because we were getting so much feedback from this group of people, or 
the, these parents or this um and mm -hmm. at least one of those changes we actually were uh <laughs> not super happy about but mm -hmm. they're going they're going for feedback and they're listening to it so if you have a concern with the purchasing guide submit the feedback form we were saying that early on when it came to the spending caps and that made a difference it made yep. a difference for uh, step up and it made a difference for the DOE and it made a difference for the whole process. Yep. And eventually those spending caps got removed. So um, the feedback does matter. So make sure that you fill out the feedback form. If there's something that doesn't make mm -hmm. sense to you, if the supplies limit once per year on elective supplies doesn't make sense to you, give them that feedback because mm -hmm. it's possible that they just haven't thought through they might have had something very specific in mind when they put that limit and might not have thought about things like canvases and paint. Um, mm. So submit that feedback to them if it's something that you're concerned about because they they are actually, they're required by statute to listen to that feedback, but they also sure. want to listen to that feedback. Um, yeah, from our they do. And and again, the the focal point here is that the pressure of competitive advantage. There are other scholarship funding organizations that want to come into Florida. Um, there are, and we have two currently in Florida and it has kind of been, one of them will, you know, permit things and one of them won't. And then they're required to have unanimous consent. And then it takes forever for the purchasing guide to get out. And what, what hopefully these changes in the statute will do as we move forward. They're not even enacted yet. They'll be enacted in Ju July 1st, uh, as soon as they're signed off on. But what, what they'll aim to do is allow that document to have more flexibility and more adaptability. So you get a bunch of parents with their feedback and what they're trying to do and what they're wanting to do, um, <clears throat> especially if it dwarfs the number of bad actors in terms of like, well, we trying to avoid this in this scenario. And it's like, yeah, but then also this is a legitimate concern and need that you haven't contemplated. They can react to that feedback in real time. Um, whereas getting all of this stuff dumped into statute is not ideal, right? Because that, that would make it where it's almost, almost impossible to get modified versus a live document that can be updated in those posts. Those updates have to be posted within 30 days as they take parent feedback. I just, so. just want to add to that, that mm -hmm. the fact that they can change it, though, is also a potential concern, which is yeah, why, <laughs> which is why you have people like us, um, you know, watching things and uh, mm -hmm. advocating for parents, not only with STEPA, but with the DOE and with other certainly. entities, because um, yeah. <clears throat> anytime that you have something that is able to be modified like that there's always the parent concern i mean i heard this concern mm -hmm. all the way back to the implementation of pep and, and ua was dealing with it even then where spending caps weren't there and then they were put back in and then they mm -hmm. were like they took them out but how do we know they're not going to add them back Certainly. again so there's constantly a need for um someone to be staying on top of it and making sure that parents concerns are being heard which is uh, another piece that we do <laughs> yeah and it gives us do. it gives us great um yeah. i, I want to say ammunition you know in our conversations when we're talking with people and they're like oh well do you have an example of that like use the forum because you know if you're putting your concerns there we even have a thread um that's about especially pep the, you know we have the ua thread as well but you can place your concerns there you can place your your feedback there what it is you would like to see and if that gets a thousand votes up and it, it becomes obvious like oh this is really important um, a well-articulated need with a testimony and a couple of parents who agree and then a thousand upvotes like those those things matter those things matter uh, and they carry weight uh, michelle wilson asks a, another question she says one more question a previous email said that instrument maintenance and repair would be covered but the new guide still lists it as prohibited um, absolutely. Um, I'm, I, I'm aware of that as well. Go yeah, ahead. I don't know what happened there. I don't know if they mm -hmm. just forgot to remove the prohibition from the new guide mm -hmm. or if they try or maybe it was sent out in an error in the initial mm -hmm. email. But um, my advice on that would be if you're running into a reimbursement issue, send them a screenshot of the email 
that mm-hmm. stated that that was going to be covered. Feedback form now. And yeah. and submit the feedback form, but also yeah. when you are uploading for, you know, when you're negotiating that reimbursement, they give you like a chance to upload additional documentation or whatever you're able to do or when you're, uh, if you reach out to customer support, show them the screenshot of the email because I've, I saw the email as well and it clearly mm-hmm. states that they were adding the maintenance as a covered yep. expense. So you should be able to hold them to that. Yeah, so the, definitely feedback form, uh, 100% all day long. Uh, yeah. Even put, you know, the date that the email came out and put in quotation marks, here's what it said, you know, why haven't you honored this in the new guide mm-hmm. and just submit. Like, there's nothing wrong with holding people accountable to things that they have said they were going to do. Um, and then obviously the purchasing guide comes out and it's not in there. So uh, we're in alignment and we're, we're with you on that one. So we hear you. Um, we just use those, use those methods that we have, uh, especially if you want to go over to the forum Somebody has a uh, screenshot of it that they want to post and help people out. We can work together on things like that. And um, Adrian Harvey says, along those lines, testing fees, people are being asked to submit tutoring type information for proctors when trying to get reimbursed for purchasing assessments. Uh, That's a good point. That's a good point, regardless of the testing requirements. Um, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. But that's interesting. Yeah, I've, um, I've heard some, I've seen some posts about that where, mm-hmm. you know, even if the test allows for parents to proctor it, uh, one thing I suggested to somebody that worked for them, so I'll suggest it again, mm-hmm. screenshot whatever it is in the manufacturer's, uh, because Step Up is saying that you can go by the manufacturer's instructions in, in terms mm-hmm. of proctoring. So screenshot the manufacturer's instructions for that test that state it can be proctored at home by a parent and mm-hmm. try to get in the screenshot, you know, the, the website so they know it's official from the testing or if you're doing it from a booklet, take a picture um, mm-hmm. and submit that with your reimbursement. You may have to submit a new reimbursement for it if you've already been denied or something. But mm-hmm. there was a parent that had the same issue with one of the tests that can be proctored. And I suggested that. And once she submitted that documentation, they reimbursed it. So I think in that situation, what you're dealing with is not a policy issue with Step Up. It's a lack of education of the actual processors. Like they don't understand the requirements for how to approve or not approve (laughs) test purchases. So, um, because again, it's different for PEP. Like they probably haven't done a lot of stuff before that didn't require teaching credentials. But now you have parents that are able to proctor these standardized tests because of the PEP requirements. So you just may have to submit the documentation showing that that's an allowed type of proctoring for that particular examination. If that yeah. well, well, the previous scholarship, F- uh, FESUA, did not require a test Mm-hmm. So it followed the evaluations for home education. And in all likelihood, many of those parents with children with unique abilities are not testing their kids. So it's not even a point of concern for UA. And then those that got an EO scholarship are going to a private school. So the private school is handling all of that. So this is the right. first time, first scholarship yeah. that allows parents to proctor their test. And that was a decision made by the Department of Education as far as the language you just referred to, Crystal. Right. And right. I think that that's what we're running into with the reimbursements is that the mm-hmm. processors are just unfamiliar with this particular type of reimbursement. Mm-hmm. So you just might have to provide a little bit of extra documentation um, and type in the notes too. Like, even if you want to type it on your actual screenshot, like, you know, mm-hmm. we're allowed to administer according to the manufacturer's instructions. Here's a screenshot of those instructions. Parent proctoring is allowed just mm-hmm. because you may have a processor who isn't familiar with all those nuances. So, yeah. And in our conversations with, with them they've also i've also kind of made some recommendations to them about being more proactive in external communication with the public 
so that there are things that you're asking for that you can track what's happening on them and things like that, but like what they're working on new vendors that might be um, coming up soon or in the process of processing or <laughs> in the process of processing or have been processed um, and added that we might not know about because there's, there's just not a lot of proactive information that they're getting and they, they really liked that feedback. Um, so they might, they might be leaning toward implementing some of those, but those are, you know, that that's literally almost a full-time job um, and just to track all of that internal, uh, what's happening in all the departments, all the different programs and how they happen and communicate that out effectively and all that changed. And then, you know, if they, even if they did that, that was somebody's job to do that once a month, there's gaming companies that do that and they do that regularly and they literally assign that to a person and that's that person's job. So it, there's a lot that they're, I'm not trying to make excuses, but there's a lot that they're going through and that, that that's going on that we definitely don't know about. I would just kind of take suggest that we take heart in knowing that the the document is now going to be a live document that can be updated with more uh, more dexterity or more adaptability as we move forward. And that the feedback, uh, I think the the parent feedback is going to be so much more important as we move forward. Yeah, and just it'll be able to be updated. I just want to give a general tip. Or people dealing to step up again we haven't had as much experience with AAA, so i can't really speak to their process certainly um but in general you cannot submit too much information with your reimbursement i just want to say because this uh af after dealing with a lot of parent questions and helping them kind of go back and forth with step up um the more information you can submit even to the point of some people having reimbursements denied where the exact mm -hmm. same reimbursement was previously approved They've started submitting with their next reimbursement if it's like a recurring thing, like a sport, um, you know, like martial arts that they do monthly or whatever. Mm -hmm. They start submitting the reimbursement numbers of the previous one saying, by the way, this is a recurring expense. It was a previously approved under these numbers. Yeah. And that fixed the problem. So I think it's because it's not always going to the same processor. Same processor, yeah. But if you can show them that it was approved before, they can just quickly reference that and go, oh, yeah. okay, yeah, this has already been vetted. And that seems mm -hmm. to help. So I know it's a little bit of extra legwork as a parent, but if you're having an issue, mm -hmm. I think the easiest fix is just to submit as much information as possible to make their job easier on the processing. So, Well, there's always a lot going on uh, with us. So Brenda will we'll venture back for that early part of the conversation of other things that are happening and going on. You had mentioned before we jumped on the live stream that we are looking for uh, bill sponsors for other issues and that it's important as we get involved um, that we help our home education community as they want to get involved as well in political campaigns and helping out to build those relationships. Um, what are some of the things that we're looking out for? In terms of... Um... Uh, the issues political or, campaigns or what? Uh, no, the issues that we're looking out for for um, uh, finding someone to sponsor the bill for it. Oh, there are definitions and things like that. that we're... I definitely believe that we need definitions in statute. We tried to mm -hmm. push for that early on in this session, and uh, the legislature didn't want to deal with that this year. Um, and I really feel like we need to have a work group because there are different forms of meeting compulsory attendance that various groups are trying to push for. And um, they did slip one in in this final version to deal with the uh, hybrid schools um, that yeah. would allow schools that meet the qualification of an approved private school that are in statute, mm -hmm. they bent the, the way of attendance so that the private schools could do, was it two or three days at school? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then uh, the other two days at home, that definition um, 
if, if we're going to allow that, um, I mean, I don't, I'm not the one that makes the rules, but if the <laughs> right. legislature is going to allow that, mm-hmm. um, there's such inconsistency between which private mm-hmm. schools can participate, which how many days they have to be there. But then you have Florida virtual school that kids are not technically in attendance at with the direct uh, contact with their mm-hmm. teacher in a physical location. Um, so you've got extremes where the the EOs have to be in the private school um, five days a week, you know, in direct contact at the physical location. Well, my contention is now that they've opened it up for the schools to do that and be hybrid schools, those students shouldn't be PEP students. They should be in a category of being a private school student, thus not taking away PEP scholarships from parents who want to direct their education of their children. The difference being the Mm -hmm. parent is in charge of directing the education in a PEP program, whether you, your child uh, does um, home education instructional program classes, or you do it all at home, or you do Mm -hmm. two in Florida virtual and two in dual Mm -hmm. enrollment, all those eclectic combinations that, Mm -hmm. that are available to home education students in the, in the case of the hybrid schools, the school is in charge of the education. And even if the parents do the work at home, it's still the school that determines what they're going to be taught when, you know, what the uh, curriculum is going to be. It's a difference in charge of who is in the program, who's directing the program. So, it's it's just totally inconsistent that you would have a PEP student mm-hmm. doing a hybrid school. Why aren't they in EO and not? Because that's an unlimited program. And it would make way more sense to give them a scholarship as a private school student than it would be to take away one of the currently limited yeah. scholarships from a parent that's directing the education of their child. And th- so, those kind of things are going to take some putting our heads together with the various groups. And then as far as home education instructional programs, we had a Mm -hmm. definition for that um, through pressure for uh, step up to change the definition. Mm -hmm. I think they created a whole problem that is going to be very difficult in the future without going into detail. Yeah. So if micro schools want to be uh, recognized as approved schools, they need to come up with their own definition. We tried to help them this year and gave them a good starting point for getting it in statute written out yeah. on paper. Not our job. We're not being paid to do that. But because it's <laughs> infringing on the home education instructional programs, which are our business, Mm -hmm. I'm concerned that if something happens in the way they've defined those home education instructional programs from the push of the micro schools, that more regulation is going to come down on the home education education instructional programs. Mm -hmm. And we try very hard to keep the guidelines separate so that our people have the most freedom possible. So those are just a few of the concerns. Yeah. Yeah, The concerns that we have, and we've got to build part of, part of the way you get legislation passed is you get enough people in leadership to support your position. That is very difficult to do once the session or even the committee meetings begin because kind of their thoughts are already in place. Leadership's telling Mm -hmm. staff what to write. So what we need to do as soon as uh, the leadership is established in the House and the Senate going forward, that we are able to get to them early enough that that becomes something that we've educated the leadership people about whether they're the speaker or the Senate Mm -hmm. president or 
the committee chairs for education. We got to get to those people and explain our viewpoint. And hopefully yep. it works much better if we have, and this is something that Jason harps on all the time, is unity among those people. We can support the micro school people as long as they're not part of the home education instructional program. So if we can all come together and agree that these are definitions, these mm -hmm. are things that would benefit parents to have in statute, then we mm -hmm. all agree there's no group out there that is pushing back against, you know, what the right. group decision has been. And, it, and very clearly, I think that it's important as we're as we're looking to find those definitions. It's not an us versus them scenario. It's it's really about the parents having the choices and the freedoms, you know, at arm's length that they want to have, but also making sure that what those are are clearly defined so that, you know, something does happen in one of them. It doesn't bleed over and negatively affect the others. Right. So, right. Right. I think that stuff's very important that it, it just be called what it is, line out what that means. You know, we have so many words that we've come across, you know, umbrellas, blended programs, hybrid programs. We, I mean, I, we addressed hybrid programs. Uh, Miranda Padilla is on our, our stream here. She just said, ha ha, amen to the inconsistency, Brenda. We've, we've addressed, you know, the, or, or I say we, but the legislators addressed that that one issue and like no one can still define what a hybrid program is so things like that are very important we're making solutions for things that you know it's uh they're not very we clearly defined time. yeah so that's important so as we're doing campaigning or looking to help with campaigning and be present remember it's really important from where we are to as we go to work with the legislators and lobby and say hey this is important to the home education community <clears throat> that they have a mental point of reference for that. Excuse me. <clears throat> I just hit puberty yesterday. <clears throat> that they have a mental point of reference for what that means uh, and what that looks like. And they'll remember you walking with them in their campaign or helping them out in their campaign in, in some way. So they'll have a point of reference for that whenever we go to talk to them. Or perhaps it's you that'll, that, you know, as one of their constituents says, hey, listen to these people because they're they're with us and they know what we need and they you know they're helping us out and so we we kind of come together um and using those connections gets us in the door whenever it it otherwise would just be you know a random email or a call that we're trying to touch base with someone on when, when something is very important um this year is a great example of <clears throat> we had a couple we had a couple of really really good contacts and I will say that I will not stop singing the praise the praises of Mike Beltran, Representative Beltran, the because he was literally the only guy who was willing to stand up, hear hear from his constituents, and hear from us and stand up and vote his conscience and say no to the bill because it didn't do what he what it he thought it should do. Um, when the House voted on it, it still had that equipment language in it. So he voted correct. against the bill. So he voted against it. The only one. And I loved that he got to stand up uh, on the, the last day when they were introducing the bill. And not so much given I told you so, but, you know, he was able to proudly stand up and say he was the one who the one to vote it down. But he was happy to vote it up because they fixed the issues with it. And I think more connections like that are really, really important. Um, really important, especially when their main job is to represent their constituents, which would be you, um, and, and you coming from their area and their districts. And so that, that really is their whole job. Um, a lot of that gets lost in career making and decisions and negotiations behind closed doors, but sometimes you matter more to them than those things and representing you well is something that they're very interested in doing, especially if they want to get reelected. So <laughs> whenever you spend time with them in their, in their political walk and in their journey it, and, and then we're all having this unity of voice, it really helps us kind of break through some of those moments that were of an otherwise easily ignorable email notification. Um, so that being said, um, 
I do think that kind of covers everything that we had on the list today. Brenda, is there anything else? Oh, wait, there's one more question, I think. Uh, geez, the last comment, I promise. Yeah. I think one item in the new legislation that hasn't been discussed a lot, but starting for the new school year cycle, you can only apply for one scholarship. So no more applying for PEP while waitlisted for UA. Um, I can't speak too much about how they're going to handle that. That is true. That is the intent and purpose of that legislation that, that they introduced was that they were under the impression parents were applying for two scholarships uh, and trying to get both. Um, that's obviously not the case. However, I mean, some might have been trying to game the system. I don't know. But they that weren't was, allowed to have two in previous legislation. They weren't. Yeah, they weren't. But, you know, there's other things that they weren't allowed to do that, you know, that didn't stop right. them from blowing trying smoke to fix about. That's a program, right. A problem that didn't <clears throat> exist. That didn't exist. So, uh, but that that's that's ultimately the kind of the spirit behind it. And so the outcome of that legislation language was to make it so that they couldn't apply for more than one at a time. And you're right. They're, they are working on ways, however, to help parents who might be qualified for UA but waitlisted um, in terms of helping them find the best place to fit. Um, you, you won't be able to apply for both. So it, it's, it is something to keep in mind. There is a... If you can't apply for both, it doesn't mean that you can't declare intent for right like i would like this one or that one whichever's not waitlisted and i think that they're aware of that um facet um meaning that it's not technically been applied for but you're declaring an intent this is what you're trying to do for your child etc and so there i do know that they're working on a way to help parents um identify which scholarship is best for them and which one they might be qualified for and what their opportunity looks like in terms of wait lists. And they're working on a, a more robust application process for that. Um, this is step up for students. I can't speak to AAA. Um, but as of yet, they haven't landed on, or I haven't heard that they've landed on a specific uh, mechanism for that. But um, just, just know that they're, tr they're trying to serve. They really are trying to serve parents the best way that they can. And um, you know, a lot of, they're aware that there will be parents who are in that situation, who, you know, apply for UA, get waitlisted, and would like to use PEP um, because they've realized that they won't be getting UA. Like, so they're aware of that, and they, like Jason said, they're working on solutions to that for parents. Well, in addition to that, uh, the legislat legislative special session in December cleared the waiting list by allowing all those parents to be approved for scholarships. So we're starting with not the buildup of waiting lists that we had in mm -hmm. the past. And they increased the number, uh, the percentage of students that could be awarded a scholarship for UA by, I think it went from 3% to 5%. Jason, is that what you remember? Yes. Yes. Without going back and looking at the bill, I think that's mm -hmm. correct. And so, so they, so my assumption would be, and you get in trouble with assumptions. <laughs> yeah, they do something. <laughs> but I'm going to lay it out there. Okay. I think that if your child has a, you uh, has a, if, if the child qualifies for a UA scholarship, the chances of you getting one in the upcoming year, if that's your first choice, is going to be more likely than it has been in the past. I think that's the attempt in making both of those changes in legislation. Also, uh, Miranda Padilla says, I, she says here uh, in her comment, I also wonder if they did the one application rule for budgeting and planning purposes. Imagine every person applying for every scholarship. It would be hard to determine the PEP caps and, and such. Uh, I I do know for a fact that that has been something that has complicated it for them. They'll right. have reached their cap and then suddenly 
500 decline. And, you know, it's because they they released the UA and went over there. And then it's like, okay, well, now we're not capped on PEP. And it, and it, it creates an internal uh, wave of just chaos uh, going from this to that. And how many dropped over there and how many we have over here. And uh, so I, I, knew, I do think that that's a part of it. Um, but they're looking for ways to make their application process a little bit more robust to really, truly serve the needs of parents. You're talking about step up. Step up, yes. Yes, step up is. Um, To serve the needs of parents and help them identify the the option that would best suit them for that year. Um, So if they're, you know, if they're capped on UA and things like that, but they are trying to find a way to still help you that year. Um, I think to the hard, hard line um, dates that were put in the statute, we didn't know how many people were going to apply for PEP last year. Mm -hmm. And so now if you have one, you have to declare by May 31st. We were trying to get them to push it back. Um, I think it was May, so. 30 yeah, May 31st. It could, you'll you'll figure it out. We tried <laughs> to down. get them to push it to June, but they yeah. didn't. So it's May. Yeah. Um, but then then before they actually get the money to award the scholarships, if you're already in the program and you declare by that date that you still want it, then they're going to know how many scholarships they have left to award. Right. Um, which they didn't know last year. So. Yeah. A lot of this is just trying to work through a new new program, trying to figure out how to make it work. And mm-hmm. I think that there will be less confusion going forward than there has been in the past. That's yeah. the way I'm and, looking at it. And honestly, I'm excited about the purchasing guide change. I'm so glad that they struck the language from 1403, but I'm also pretty excited about the purchasing guide change that they made because it will allow the SFOs independently to be more flexible, which will also allow them to be a bit more competitive with one another in terms of how they manage it, which is good for us. So anywho, is there anything else, Brenda, before we bring the day to a close? It's been a great stream. There's always stuff. I mean, you know, there is, (laughs) there are going to be issues with the new SFO. If there are new SFOs coming in, all that Mm -hmm. legislation is going to have to be reviewed and, are we going to get people that are going to commit fraud, which we had when they first didn't have any guidelines? And then does that affect the program? Yeah. So, you know, there's always things that we will be looking Watching. at and making sure mm-hmm. that nothing happens that's going to uh, impact the program going forward. Mm-hmm. One quick thing I want to yeah. want to mention because there's as soon as this goes into effect, and it may be July one on the bill that uh, provides a unique waiver for the hours that home education student and virtual school students can work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that's really a great um, change in law that was um, basically. Um, Senator Burgess's um, yeah, initiative. Great. He homeschools and some of his constituents may have brought that to his attention. It was something that I was aware of and just didn't have the energy to push this year for that particular thing. But I'm so glad because the way it was implemented, I went to bat with some of the agencies about allowing flexibility for homeschool students work hours and they were adamant. They're so mad. They are adamant, so they're going to have to just suck mm-hmm. it up and give us some freedom. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, told, I told somebody in the district one time, if you continue to do what you're doing, which is not in statute, then I'm going to have to go change the law. I don't think they believed it, but that's what we did. <laughs> and we said <laughs> the districts cannot ask for more information that is in the statute from parents. Mm-hmm. So we tighten that down. So this one we've opened up by putting it in statute. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's it then for the day. That's a great high note. 
I think, to end on as well. So we will go ahead and visit our top sponsor one more time. Thank you, FPEA, for being with us. If you guys have not registered yet, I do think you should jump on that. It's a, it's a great convention, a, a lot, especially if you're new. A lot of new homeschooling families and home education families have historically kind of gone there to kind of figure things out and then just felt at ease and felt at home with all the options and the the people who have experiences and 12 kids. So we've only got the starter pack. We've only got four, but you know, there's so many experiences and cool things that you'll, you'll run into there and it, it's, it's wild and wonderful, but all right, without further ado, we will call our stream adieu, today adieu, adieu. to an end. <laughs>